And so when I say Chinese, I want you to scream out the, na the nation that's associated with this. For example, if I say Chinese, you're going to say what? China. All right, let's say it with authority. When I say Chinese, you say what? China. All right, that's just a, a test right there. So here we go. Chinese. China. Russian. Russia. Italian. Italy. German. German. Swedish. Swedish. Korean. Korea. Egyptian. Egypt. Nigerian. I hope you were able to successfully identify the issue. The lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. I said the lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. They want us to. Sell our souls to butter profit Like God's property is hard to market So we steady to aim, keep your eyes on target Cause when you got the drive, yeah, they'd rather you park it But I don't valet, you ain't getting these keys I'm keeping close hands, I'm on bending knee I'm just a reflection, dealing with eight sections Art mixed with life, you can feel the convection You lie and won't sleep The lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. I said the lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. They want us to sell our souls to butter profit. Like God's property is hard to market. So we send you the aim. Keep your eyes on target Cause when you got the drive Yeah, they'd rather you park it But I don't valet You ain't getting these keys I'm keeping close hands I'm on bending knee I'm just a reflection Dealing with eight sections Art mixed with life You can feel the convection You lying won't sleep tonight Cause we woke now And we woke now I said the lion won't The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. I know that you, know, you know what you are? are You're we? an ancient Israelite. Well, ancient Israelite, that's who we are. are. That's who we are. Sure. If you give me time, yeah. if you give me time, but, 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 no, 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 we don't have so many years. I know, I know. Look, look at this. This is pages and pages of yes. notes, and I promise we'll give yes. more teaching. But here is my challenge to you. All right, I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites, or you want to be Jews? Do you want to? Re I'm hearing some of your traditions. It's like the days of the Bible. Yes. Do you want to remain ancient Israelites or you want to be Jews? That is the question I have for you. Thank you. I'll answer that question. Go, Go ahead. ahead. I will help you. After the demise of Solomon, we now have the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. Yes. So when we talk about Jews, Jews are Israelites, but all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Jews are Israelites. But all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Jews are Israelites. But all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. So when we talk about Jews, Jews are Israelites. But all Israelites are not Jews. The ten tribes that got lost are not Jews. They were Israelites. Well, it's depending. So, uh, well, the minority uh, cannot swallow the majority. We are here. We are the majority uh, down here. Yeah. 
So you are minority and we are older than you. The same people that have stripped us of our identity. The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black and the vernacular that we're supposed to have. Assalamu alaikum. In the 13th tribe, Arthur Kosler traces the origin of Eastern Europe's Jewish population that was largely decimated by the Nazi onslaught during the Second World War. Through extensive research, he discusses the history of a trading empire that was set up by a tribe known as the Khazars. The Khazar Empire was located between the expanding power blocks of Christianity and Islam, and the people were converted to Judaism by their king as a way of standing apart from both. The Khazarians and their wealth were dispersed through the countries of Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Khazar Empire. The Khazarians were not a Semitic people that they called themselves Jews after their conversion to Judaism is as absurd as the Chinese Muslims calling themselves Arabs. Is as absurd as the Chinese Muslims calling themselves Arabs. Is as I was told welcome home because I'm Jewish. Every single person who's Jewish that steps off the plane, especially for their first time in Israel, is told welcome home. Let's just sit with that for a second. This right here, this is my actual ancestry. I am 88% Ashkenazi Jewish, and none of my ancestors are from the Middle East. Uh, the entire Bible is about black uh, the entire Bible is about black people. Um, not only was Jesus black, but every character in the Bible seems to be black too. Yeah, Zephaniah and Jeremiah and Jebediah, those, those all aren't white people names, okay? Um, and Jesus wasn't some tan, partially melanated Middle Eastern person either. I'm talking straight up black dude, okay? Even in the book of Revelation, when you get the vision of Daniel, he's describing someone with feet like burnt brass and white woolly hair, and we've got the deep running water voice with the, the red eyes, and uh, you guys, he's black. The Jewish people are black people, like Kanye was right. I want to say peace and blessings, family. Hope all is well with you guys. I know that this is a uh, unscheduled live tonight, so I don't expect to have maximum participation. I just decided to do this live tonight, um, dealing with the um, still tying into the uh, the the um, eclipse that um, that is anticipated on. Uh, April 8th. So I wanted to do a, a, a lesson here because I didn't even realize uh, tomorrow, according to the Christian church, is uh, supposed is Good Friday to them. And so I wanted to do a lesson uh, still dealing with the spring equinox. Uh, well, not the spring equinox, but the um, the eclipse, but also show you why uh, tomorrow, it's not a good Friday. And I'm going to really explain all these things to you guys. I'm really going to explain these things to you guys because it's a lot of stuff that's going on right now. Uh, this is where we, you know, when you see key uh, prophecies like, uh, or should I say uh, events like this, you start really seeing a lot of prophecies or should I say uh, loose prophecies or uh assumptions that are disguised as biblical prophecies really start going to an all-time high. I mean, you really start seeing all kinds of 
deceptions that that is tossed uh, around, tossed about. And so I really want to uh, talk with you guys tonight. I want to deal with uh, Good Friday. I want to also touch a little bit on the sign, because I know that you guys probably saw what uh, me and my cousin Benaya and others have taught on signs, right? And for those that really uh, don't know me in terms of this is your first time hearing me or you, you're you not familiar with uh, my, my angle, I really do a lot of study with um, ancient Hebrew. And I encourage you guys to have some lessons on the Patreon account. And I got to get caught up to speed with that. But I have some Hebrew, ancient Hebrew uh, lessons there. Uh, just really giving you some basic foundation uh, of ancient Hebrew. And what I want to do is introduce you guys to a letter. Yes, you see it on the screen. I want to go ahead and stretch this out here so you can see it. And I know some of you guys are probably trying to uh, put two and two together, trying to figure out, wow, Pastor, what does that have to have, have to do with anything? Right. See, all the letters you know, there's some key information in all the letters. And I know that uh, when I taught uh, over the past couple of weeks, I taught about the word sign in ancient Hebrew, ath, uh, which is the alap in atha. Uh, but this is another letter. And I encourage you guys that if you get a chance, you could go into some of the older lessons that I've taught uh, in regards to the resurrection. Uh, what day it was. And you'll see that I really been teaching this for quite some time. So this is nothing new. This is something that I've been teaching for quite some time. So I'm going to introduce some of you guys that may not be familiar with ancient Hebrew. I'm going to introduce you to another letter here. And as you see, I, I gave a indicator here on how we could really navigate uh, through this lesson that we're getting ready to go into. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the lesson. And um, one last thing real quick, I want to make this clear. Uh, when we deal with these signs, be careful, family, uh, because again, there's a lot of junk doctrine out here all around us. So when we deal with April 8th, it is uh, a uh, a total eclipse Right. And we're going to give some clarity here in terms of how to calculate the calendar, when to when to honor the Passover and all that other stuff. So I want to make sure that you guys be careful. Be careful. There's so much out here. Junk doctrine that's out here. All right. The world is not coming to an end. If you understand scripture. Right. There's other things that ha that, that that has to take place after this key sign that we see coming about. So don't get caught up with the end of the world. I'm still trying to figure out where the three days of darkness have, has come from. Um, you know, I'm really trying to understand some of these things, you know, because I'm seeing a lot of things in these YouTube streets. So, but nevertheless, let's go ahead and get into a family. But I just want to warn you, I'm not here teaching that the world is coming to an end. I'm not here teaching you to sell your, your belongings and just sit home and anticipate the world coming to an end. I just want to reiterate that point because again, this is the, the, the time that you hear a lot of uh, teachings that's going to toss people to or fro. All right. But nevertheless, let's go ahead and get into a family. And I um, want to give a shout out here real quick to my sister. I see sister Carol in the building, always holding it down. Really appreciate her for uh, giving me the recommendation to start this lesson on uh, this platform here because I was going to give up on YouTube because of all the craziness that was uh, taking place here. want to give shout outs to Greg. Look like this is my brother. That's uh, I'm not going to say the location, but I uh, want to say Shalom to you. Kwam Yasharala, in other words, rise. Really appreciate you. And some of you other guy, uh, other people that have been supporting over time, Sister Yvette Rivera, uh, Thank you for the love and support. But anyway, family, we'll give some shout outs as we progress here. Don't want to miss out. But at the same time, don't want to prolong the lesson because I know that it's uh, uh, late for many. And I want to get as much as I can here. 
So I want to start off by saying the title of this lesson is It's Not a Good Friday, Signs and Lying Wonders. So we're going to debunk Good Friday, but then we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to walk you guys through how to really calculate uh, what is what around us? What? How do we calculate the new year for Israel? And I want to show you how to do that, starting with the very first year. And we're gonna. It's going to be all biblically based. It's not going to be stretching scriptures out of context. This is using the scriptures as our foundational uh, text. All right, our, our primary source. All right. So again, it's not a good Friday signs and lying wonders. All right. So let me see here. What is this right here? Let me make sure I got this slide correct here. All right. All right. Let me fix this real quick. I see my error right now. All right. Here we go. Let me rearrange this real quick. All right. Here we go. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Verse three is what we're going to in through nine. That is what we're going to read tonight. And it reads. Let no man deceive you. Let me say that again. This is the same lines that Hamashiach in Matthew chapter 24. He started off with this same line to his disciples. Let no man deceive you. The Messiah had to tell this to his own disciples who sat up under him for for almost uh, for um, anywhere from two and a half to three years, sat up under his his teachings for that that entire time span, that entire block of time. And they heard this over and over. But the Messiah warned them. They, they ate directly off the plate of the Messiah. And yet he warned them not to be deceived. So that tells you this this deception is strong. If the if the Messiah had to say to his disciples not to be deceived. He told them to hearken in the Hebrew word of Shammai or Shammai, which means listen with intelligence. So let no man deceive you. By any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And for some of you guys that may not know, right, that word Nephilim or Napal Yam, right, that Nephilim rather, or Napal Yam, I'm saying in both ancient Hebrew and Israeli language, right? That word Nephilim also means falling away. It doesn't just mean giant. And you'll see that word Nephilim used in different ways, not just associating with giants, but people what falling away, bully, right? So these are some of the other characteristics when it comes to people opposing the most high. So again, it says, except there come a falling away first. So family, when you think about that word Nephilim, again, do not always associate it with giants. Right. This word is also used for falling away. So you have so many brothers and sisters that are operating under the Nephilim spirit, the Nephilim spirit, excuse me. Meaning because they are falling away. So it says, except there come a falling away first. So we see this before our eyes right now. There is a falling away. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And I encourage you guys go into the foundational lesson and also the prophecies uh, playlist. And I really break down the son of perdition. We're not going to do that tonight because that's a lesson inside itself. And I want to make this clear. There is a difference between the antichrist and a difference between the son of perdition. This here is, ha has nothing to do with Judas because Judas is referred to as the son of perdition. But this prophecy right here, Judas has already passed away. He's already gone. 
All right. And again, we're not dealing with Antichrist. If you study the lessons, if you study the scriptures, the Antichrist is the people that have what? Fallen away. They was connected. They was part of the fold. They was part of the faith. They was part of this uh, this awakening. And when they got this information presented to them, they decided to what? Fall away. Many have gone back into the very places that they were deceived. You know, many went back into the church and guess what? This is happening right now. So many have fallen away or you have brothers and sisters that are still in the church and you shared this truth with them and you gave them an opportunity to move upon it, but they chose to stay where they are. They chose to stay in the deception. So I want to make sure you guys understand when we deal with the son of perdition, we're dealing uh, with a group of individuals, a bloodline. So I want to also put a little, little nugget out there. So I encourage you guys again, watch the lesson, go, go and review the lesson I did on the son of perdition, but let's get back into it. All right. It says again, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except for, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is Allahim or called Allahim, or that is worship, so that he as Yahweh sitteth in the temple of Yahweh, showing himself that he is Yahweh. All right, we have so much proof of this. And this is not just with the Roman Catholic Church. This is not just with the Christian Church. This is not just with Judaism. It's, it's all together. It's all the, it's all together. And I'll just give you a little nugget. When you start understanding Japheth, right, and you understand the prophecies of uh, of uh, Genesis chapter nine, verse uh, starting at verse twenty four, you'll start understanding who this son of perdition is. So who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called Allahim or that is worshipped so that he as Yahweh sitteth in the temple of Yahweh showing himself that he is Yahweh. So, of course, again, when many of us think about this, you're going to automatically default to the pope. Right. As being the son of perdition, as being the one that's trying to make himself look like he's the father or behave as if he is the father. But it's not just the pope. That's why I say it's not just uh, a, an individual. It's a group of people is coming at, that comes out of that line of Shem. Uh, not Shem, but um, Japheth that comes out of the line of Japheth. Excuse me for saying Shem, but that comes out of the line of Japheth. So let me give you a nugget of this deception. Does having Jewish DNA determine your Jewish status? Great question. Oops, wrong, wrong, um, excuse me, wrong lesson. I mean, wrong, wrong clip. Excuse me, family. I'm fumbling over my clips tonight, but this is the clip I wanted you guys to hear. And you know what else, Jim? I, I just want to say this to our Christian friends, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just to, just to call it as it is and say it straight out, you know, you, you guys are worshiping one Jew. That's a mistake. You should be worshiping every single one of us because we all die for your sins every single day. And that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. We're, we're all God's first and We're dying for your sins right now because, because the Jewish people in the land of Israel are the bulwark mm -hmm. against the orcs. Mm -hmm. Okay? The orcs are coming not to a theater ne near you, but to your home. All right. Did you guys catch that? Let me play it one more time and then we'll continue with the lesson. Listen to what this this Jewish person, this rabbi who has a very popular channel among their community. All right. Listen one more time to what he says. About who should be worshiping who. Let me go back to it. I just skipped it here. Let me see. I just had it here. Uh, bear with me one moment. Here we go. And you know what else, Jim? I, I just want to say this to our Christian friends, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, 
just to, just to call it as it is and say it straight out, you know, you, you guys are worshiping one Jew. That's a mistake. You should be worshiping every single one of us because we all die for your sins every single day. And that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. We're, we're all God's first burner. We're dying for your sins right now because, because the Jewish people in the land of Israel are the bulwark yeah. against the orcs. Mm -hmm. Okay? The orcs are coming not to a theater ne near you, but to your home. All right, family. So I hope that's an eye opener to many of you guys. So we're not just dealing with uh, the Pope, but we can use the Pope. We can use Judaism. We can use Islam. We can use so many different religious systems that have been established by the sons, the bloodline of Japheth. OK. So we can pull out anyway. I'm not I'm not trying to uh, revisit that lesson there. So I'm just going to leave that alone. But I want to make sure you guys understand. And I want to thank my sister Nora for um, posting the link about the with the lesson about the son of perdition family. Watch that lesson. Watch that lesson. And I can guarantee you so much information uh, that's going to really surprise you about. Uh, just the, the amount of information that I share there. I got a number of emails. I mean, from brothers and sisters that's out in Brazil, you know, saying how they never heard a lesson like this before. It's the first time that they really heard someone really teach this, the passages with clarity in the depth. All right. But anyway, let me give a quick shout out here before we really get into this lesson. Shout outs to brother Douglas. Uh, Worley, really thank you for the love and support and family. Let's show some love to Brother Douglas and family. Want to make it clear here. Want to announce this here. Uh, if you want to be part of our feast days, shoot me an email. I'll get, you, get the information to you because uh, we know that the Passover is on the 22nd, falls on the 22nd of April, right? And so uh, we're going to, of course, honor that internally, but then we're also going to have uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the 23rd, and then it's, it's a whole week of celebration. So we're going to continue on with the celebration on that Shabbat, which is the 27th. And if you would like to be part of, uh, you know, uh, the festivities, feel free to reach out and we'll get the information. I'll start posting uh, information about that as well. All right. So let's get back into the lesson here, family. So we see here who who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called Allahayim or that is worshiped so that he as Yahweh sitteth in the temple of Yah showing himself that he is Yah. So you have so many different people that are showing themselves to be Yah. You will have again Caesar Bourget, you guys know who that is, the Pope as well, showing himself to be himself to be the father. You know, you see the images that they have of themselves inside the temple. You see uh just what I just shared with you about the name stealers, you know, who's showing themselves uh, as if they are uh, the most high. You know, you see all of this, this taking place right now, right in front of our face. Uh, verse five. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. In other words, Paul is saying, I didn't talked about these things. I brought these things to you guys. So this tells you that this was a was not a one time conversation. And it goes on in verse six. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. So the iniquity of bending, twisting, because iniquity in the Greek is anomia, which means bend, twisting of the law, statutes and commandments. It means uh, transgression of the law. That's what iniquity means, anomia. So the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he now letter, letter, excuse me, letteth will let. Let me read it again. Excuse me for butchering it tonight. For the mystery of iniquity, anemia in the Greek, awa in the um, Hebrew, uh, in the Israeli is awa, but awa, uh, which means, again, to bend, twist, distort, uh, 
the law, statutes and commandments. So for for the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed whom Adonaiah shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse nine, even him, this is key family, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, Hashatan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. The key here is signs. This is a key, key nugget right here, signs. Let me put a scripture here just so that way you guys can understand this. Matter of fact, let me get, I'll, I'll wait till I get to that point and I'll drop another key passage here. So un, write in your, um, your notes, signs, that's a key word, signs, ah, which means proof. It means evidence. It means proof. All right. So whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. But again, signs, we see lying wonders. We see all power, not the power of the authority of the most high, of course, but we're dealing with the power of manipulation with all power and signs and lying wonders, right? So another key to understanding uh, the son of perdition, to understand the spirit this is now where we get the word troll because we're living in a day and time of trolling, right? Let's see what a troll means. According to the etymological dictionary, it says to go about stroll, a hunting term, wander, to go in quest of gain without purpose. So we see social media is filled with trolls who go about looking for uh uh, teachings or videos or discussions, live discussions that they can go in and just try to uh, disturb or distract or just undo whatever is going on, on, you know, in that video. And we get a lot of trolls, you know what I mean? Especially those that don't believe in the Messiah, you know, those that uh, don't want to read the, what they call the um, New Testament, even though I refer to it as the renewed covenant, you know, many start they troll and I, it's so many that i had to block because of that trolling right so again to go about stroll a hunting term wander to go in quest of game without a purpose so to go about stroll a hunting term wander to go in quest of game without a purpose think about that think about that think about that that characteristics right so let's deal with the the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of troll. It says to harass, to criticize, to antagonize, especially by provocatively disparaging or mocking public statements, posting or acts. Now, come on, family, we have to be real. We are being trolled. We are being trolled right now from those that call themselves Christians. We are being trolled. Are we not being trolled? Does this not fall in alignment with the trolls? If you if this falls in alignment with the, what, how many within the church are trolling right now, type one. Now, I know all you guys saw the, the videos that I posted about Candace Williams. Do you know, or Candace Owens, do you know that uh, these rabbis, right, starting with the people that own uh, that that publication, you know, that went against Candace Owens, like that uh, that unholy rabbi uh, Shmuley, you know, here I, I shared a clip of him call himself mimicking drinking Christian blood, trying to mock Candace Owens. Those guys don't believe in Hamashiach. But guess what? According to the church, we are the biggest problems. They talk more about us. Notice how most of the people in Christianity in the church are quiet. You got people that have built platforms that have done conferences off of us, but they are crickets when it comes to the name stealers. We get trolled. That's where I see. Let me um, show some of the comments here. Uh, appreciate you guys for uh, 
participation uh, for your participation. Uh, Niggist, Malaka, Adaya to the remnant. Want to say shout out to you, you my sister, type one. Yeah, we get trolled. You witnessed it firsthand. Uh, Kate Herrera, one. Nora Bain, one. Eldon, the building. Uh, you know, thank you for the love and support holding it down in Cali, one. Uh, Brother Douglas, one. Y'all, you guys know you've seen it firsthand. I got some trolls out there. I am peace, one. Chosen, one, right? We get trolled. And I know I'm not the only one that's being trolled. Man, I got trolled though. But you guys witnessed some of the trolling. And guess what? It still happens. You know, and they, in and, and disguise, they're trying to say, this is what Christ called them to do. This is what Christ would want them to do. This is what Paul would want them to do. Like my grandmother would say, the devil is a liar. All right. Devante uh, one or Devonta, excuse me, uh, one. Jaden one. Who else do we have here? All right. Simaya, Simaya one. Fred Davis one. All right. Now I want to also, let me give a shout out here. I see a couple of uh, chats coming in. I want to say shout outs to Shell Steele. Thank you for the love and support. Thank you for uh, Pastor Kelly for powerful teachings. Thank you. I really appreciate it, sis. And um, thank you for uh, the contributions tonight. I greatly appreciative. Really appreciate the love and support. And uh, family, let's show some love for Cheryl Steele for the love and support tonight. Really appreciate it. And also Sabrina Richardson. Want to thank you for the love and support. Really appreciate uh, the contributions as well. But family, again, let's let's show out, show everyone tonight that have contributed to this work, love and support. Want to thank you, brother, brother Douglas, again, again, uh, sister Cheryl. Want to thank you again, and sister Sabrina. Want to thank you again, family. Let's show them some love. All right. So let's continue here. So that's what a troll is. That is what a troll is. So we're dealing with this spirit of trolling, right? That's why. And, and guess what? Here's a key warning that is given in the scripture. This is first Peter chapter five, verse eight, first Peter chapter five, verse eight. Now tell me if this sounds like a troll. Here it is. Be sober is the warning. Be vigilant is the warning because your adversary, the devil, Shatan, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Does that, does that not fall up under the, the, the definition of a troll? Let me, let me ask you guys that, that question. Does that, that does uh first Peter uh, chapter five, verse eight, is that not a warning us about trolls? Right. That's the behavior of a troll. Hasatan or anyone has, that's that's trolling. Guess what? They're operating in the spirit of Hashatan, walking, walking about, seeking whom they may devour. Now, the key here is where it says as a roaring lion. So not the lion. So mimicking the lion. Mimicking the lion. Right. That's what Hashatan wants to do. Mimic the things of the most high. To deceive who? Yah's people. So let's go back here just to make sure you guys see here. Troll, to go about stroll, a hunting term, wander, to go in a quest of game. In other words, pray without a purpose. All right. So when we go back here, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That is trolling family. So let's transition to another portion of the lesson, because I really want to get into this because I, I know we have a, a lot to cover, but I want to get into this. And I know some of you guys probably asked this question. Why do most churches have service on Sunday? Why do most churches have have service on Sunday? Have you guys asked that question? Why do most churches have service on Sunday? Why? And we're going to answer this question. Why or should I say who changed the Shabbat to Sundays? Who felt like they had the power 
to change the Shabbat to Sundays, thus further proving and confirming the prophecy that we just read that Paul gave in 2 Thessalonians. Now these people have made themselves as if they are Yah. Who changed the Shabbat to Sundays, right? Who created Good Friday? Have any of you guys thought about that? Who created Good Friday? Have you guys, anyone figured out, have you guys, uh, you know, had an opportunity to really figure out the math of trying to squeeze three days into a day and a half? Has any of you guys figured it out how to, how to get three days into a day and a half? You know, that old saying, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Have you anyone figured that out? Because if you figured that out, I mean, you got, well, I'm going to help you write a book. I'll, I'll, I'll invest in you. Have any of you guys figured it out? If you figured it out, type one. If you haven't, type two. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm still trying to figure out how do you squeeze three 24-hour days into one, uh, into a day and a half. Anyway, you guys let me know when you figured it out. So who created Good Friday? So let's start with this here. Constantine is responsible for Sunday becoming the Christian and Catholic primary day of worship. This is coming from Philip Schaff or Schaff, History of the Christian Church, right? This is a great source. It's pretty much like an encyclopedia here. But notice what he writes here, right? Legal sanction of, of Sunday. It says here, the civil sanction of of the observance of Sunday and of the festivals of the church. The state, the state indeed should not and cannot enforce this observance upon anyone, but may undoubtedly and should prohibit the public disturbance and pro, um, profanation of the Christian Sabbath and to protect the Christian and their rights. So when they say Christian Sabbath, they're talking about Sunday worship, right? So it says, and the Christian in their right and duty of its proper observance. Constantine in 321 forbade the sitting of the of courts and all secular labor in towns on the venerable day of the sun, right? Sun worship Sunday, as he expresses himself, perhaps with reference at once to the sun god Apollo and to Christ, the true son of righteous. So here it is. He's straddling the fence. This is where you get the word syncretism. He's mixing and meshing because paying homage to the sun god Apollo. And then at the same time, uh, to Christ by what? Worshiping on Sunday. Right. So as you see here, the true son of righteous and you notice they spelt it S-U-N to his pagan and his Christian subjects. But he distinctly permitted the culture of farms and vineyards in the country, because frequently this could be attended to on no other day so well, though one were one would suppose that the hardworking up, uh, then put it all here, all the way there. But I'll continue on here at the at, in the second here. So again, Constantine uh, made a uh, rope and put into law an edict, right? A, a, an edict, excuse me, to legalize and make it official that uh, in all the land that Sunday is going to be the day of worship. That is going to be the Catholic because the word. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Christianity didn't exist back then, but uh, their so-called Christian Catholic day of worship. They call it the Christian Shabbat or Sabbath or the Catholic Sabbath. So Constantine also created Good Friday, right? Let's go back to the source, right? It says here, and at the same time, and join the, the observance of Friday and the memory of the death of Christ. So it was Constantine that 
set up this Friday, this so-called Good Friday. That's why I said it's not a Good Friday. It's not a Good Friday. Constantine signed the edict. And then we also see him creating Good Friday. He created Good Friday family. That's why you see many trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. They're trying to make three days, trying to squeeze it into a three day. And we're going to prove with this lesson as we progress here, and we're going to have to do break this up into two, but we're going to prove that that is an absolute lie, right? That is an absolute lie, a falsehood. Because the church will tell you, hey, you know, it's hard. It was hard. No, the Christians, you know, Christ died. You know, he was resurrected on, uh, on, on, on uh, the first day of the week. So he rose. So that's why they chose to move the the uh, seven day traditional Shabbat over to the first day, which is not biblical whatsoever. Actually, they're breaking the law. Statutes and commandments. Anyway, let's go ahead and continue. That's a whole nother lesson. I want to get sidetracked. So again, and at the same time enjoined the observance of Friday and the mem uh, memory of the death of Christ. So again, this, this, this source that I'm sharing with you is called History of the Christian Church. So not only did Constantine, according to them, have the power to change uh, scripture, right? And law, right? The Pope was supposedly given the same power because truth be told, Constantine was a Pope. So the Popes have the same power. Pope, the word Pope, Papa, you know, when you start getting into the Latin, Papa, that's all it is. Papa, papacy, which means father. Now you see why Christ said, call no one, call no man father. Papa said, don't even call him rabbi. Don't put him on that pedestal. All right. So this is this is a little sample of how much power. Was given to. The Pope by those that are in that religion. In 1302, Pope Boniface, the eighth issued a papal bull stating that the Pope has authority over two realms. Right. And this is just a quick source here. The most famous papal document of the Middle Ages affirming the authority of the Pope as the heir of Peter and vicar of Christ. In other words, substitute over all human authorities, spiritual and temporal. Spiritual power, according to the bull, rests in the hands of the church. Temporal power is in the hands of kings and soldiers, but is to be exercised only as the church permits because things spiritual are superior to things temporal. If temporal power errs, it is to be judged by the spiritual power. If less the spiritual power errs, it is to be judged by higher spiritual power all the way up to the supreme spiritual power, the papacy itself, which can be only judged by God. So according to their literature, the Pope can no can no one outside of the most high, according to their doctrine, hold the him accountable. So he has the power over temporal and spiritual uh, spiritual uh, realms. Right. And guess what? The Christian church still pay homage to the Pope. That's a whole nother discussion. All right. So it goes on to say here, declare state, declare state and define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. The Pope went on in 1303 to confirm the uh, disputed choice of Albert Habsburg as Holy Roman Emperor and announced that the emperor was overlord of all other rulers, including the King of France, under the ultimate supremacy of the Pope. All right. So who created a Shabbat for the Catholic Christian and Christian church. Who created the Shabbat for Catholicism? Who created it for Christianity? Right. We gave the answer, but let's take it a step further. Let's go to Reverend John Tr uh, Trilio, uh, Trilio, excuse me, Trigillo, 
excuse me if I butcher his name. Um, so I, I don't want to butcher his name even worse than what I have, have done. Uh, so it looks like Trigilio. But if I butcher it, my apologies. But let's go to his source, right? This is Catholicism for Dummies, third edition, page 256. Let's see what it says, right? It says, so why then do Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox Christians? See, many within the Catholic Church or Christian Church are trying to tell you, oh, no, we're not the Catholics. We're different from the Catholics. No, they fall up under the same tenets. The Protestant Church came from the Catholic Church. All of the, the Protestant, the ortho, all of those came from the Catholic Church, the so-called Orthodox. All of, all of that came from the Catholic Church, no matter how they try to slice and dice it. So why then do Catholic, Protestant, or Orthodox and Orthodox Christians go to church on Sunday, treating it as the Lord's Day instead of Saturday? Now, notice what he says here. In general, Catholicism and Christianity Move the celebration of the Lord's Day from Saturday to Sunday. So here it is. These non-blood descendants of Israel kicked the disciples out, kicked the blood descendants of Israel out, right? Took our heritage, and then they began to do what created a religion off of our culture. It says his celebration of the Lord's Day from Saturday to Sunday because Jesus Christ rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. Come on. We know they didn't celebrate Easter. You know, we know that they, uh, this was uh, when we start dealing with the Passover and we know the Passover was not on a Sunday. We know that the Passover was not on a Friday. The Passover was in the middle of the week. And I'm going to prove that as we uh, put this calendar together. So it says here, because Jesus Christ rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. In other words, Sunday has become the Christian Sabbath, the day of rest. Christ didn't tell them to do that. There's not a single scripture was Christ saying that for them to do that. And in fact, if you read uh, in details and really pay attention to what Gala um, the, uh, Paul's letter to the uh, Galatians, you'll see that Paul even speaks against them using Christ's uh, death to change, thinking that things have that that Christ just undid everything, undid the uh, the, the uh, law, statutes, and commandments. But anyway, let me get back into it. So Sunday has become the Christian Sabbath, the day of rest to honor the day of Christ, uh, the day uh, the day Christ rose from the dead. Jesus in the gospel that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Come on, family. That's what they're twisting. See, when you study the scriptures, right, the Shabbat is a tool for man. It's a it's, it's uh, the law that the most high put in place It's a tool. And when we see Barak it's for us to what, show our adornate, uh, uh, the honor, our adoration for the most high. And vice versa. It was made for us to bless the most high. <laughs> Come on, family. We were it was it was given to us as a salute. But they use that scripture like they do on ton of scriptures twisted around. For their own doctrine. So Christians who wanted to honor their risen Lord on the day of the week that he rose from the dead made Sunday their day of worship and we could completely obliterate that that this lie right here because the fact of the matter is the marys already they showed up to the sepulcher he was already gone right they there at the dew at the i mean at the very it was still dark outside he was already gone but anyway instead of the former day of saturday which the hebrews had honored from the time of moses now, notice what it says here in the warning. Catholics are also bound to attend a Catholic mass on each and every Sunday or the vigil mass on Saturday of every weekend in the calendar year. All right. But let's go to page 89. Let's continue here real quick. All right. It goes on to say here. Now, the scriptures alone do not contain all the truths which a Christian is bound to believe. You notice what it's saying here, right? It's telling you like, hey, no, nah, you can't trust the scriptures. Look, look, look for other content to try to support your argument. 
You know, you can't get it all out of the Bible. See, this is the argument. This is where that argument started. But notice what it says here. Not to mention other examples is not every Christian ob obliged to sanctify Sunday and to abstain on the day from unnecessary servile work. Is not the observance of this law among the most prominent of our sacred duties? But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but notice what it says. You will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. Come on, family. Come on, family. But yet they still carry out their lies. Even this person that wrote this book still honor or, or celebrate Sunday worship. But it made it clear you will not find a single line giving them the authorization to do so. Now, watch what he says afterwards. He, he, he admits all what they're doing is not biblical. You and So that's why they say, hey, you can't trust everything in the Bible. Trust third party sources, you know, sources that was been that was written in the third century. You know, the sources well after uh, Christ, his disciples they, they all died off. Sources that's after the fact. Come on, family. You will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious ob observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctified. Did you did you guys catch that, family? Did you guys catch that? He made it clear the scriptures, you will not find a single scripture to justify Sunday worship, made it clear that the scriptures, as you see here, the scriptures enforced the religious observance of Saturday, a, a day which they never sanctified from the very beginning when they started easing their way into the, you know, into the, uh, uh, the scriptures, trying to uh, study the scriptures. Right. Beyond the time of Apostle Paul, beyond the time of the disciple, beyond the time of the of of uh, the Messiah, they began to change because in Acts chapter 13, you see the non blood descendants of Israel. Guess what they did? They came on a Shabbat. They asked Apostle Paul. They asked uh, Barabbas to I mean, Barnabas. They asked them to teach them on the Shabbat. Then when you do a deeper discovery of the text, guess what? They were being taught on the Shabbat for for years. Paul taught them on the Shabbat for years. So there's not a single passage that gave them the authority. They, they appointed themselves, all right? So let's go to Albert Herbert Lewis. Let's see what he says about the Shabbat. Let's go to page 33. Notice what he says. The Christian Shabbat or Sabbath, the genuine offspring of the union of the Holy Spirit with the Catholic Church, his spouse, second, uh, the claim of Protestantism to any part, therein proved to be groundless, self-contradictory, and suicidal. The first proposition needs little proof. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of, the, of a Protestant church. So they're making it clear. Man, I, a, man, I've seen Catholic priests shut down, shut down, shut down, Protestant professors. I've seen it firsthand. Catholic priests just, just tore them up with, with theology and history. For over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, right? In other words, when you start dealing with the Protestant, you just start dealing with the Protestant movement, the Reformation and all of that. And the Protestant, this is where you get the Baptist church, the, the uh, Methodist churches. This is where you get uh, the uh, the Holiness churches. This is where you get Kojic and all those. All of that came up from underneath the Protestant church. By virtue of her divine mission, change the day from Saturday to Sunday. Let me say that again. From over 1000 years before the existence of a Protestant church, by virtue of her divine mission. So this is telling you the Catholic church change the day from Saturday to Sunday, we say by virtue of her divine mission, because he who called called himself the Lord of this Sabbath 
So they came up with their own assumptions. They came up with their own doctrine. But let's skip over to page 30 through 34. Let's see what he says. The Protestant world at its birth found the Christian Sabbath too strongly entrenched to run counter to its existence. In other words, they said it was, it, you know, it was too strong. It was being served. So many people was honoring the Christian uh, the, the first day of the week, the Sunday worship. So they it was too much for them to try to counter it. So guess what? They they fell in line, right? They fell on, they fell in code. Even though they protested the Protestant movement, they began to protest. They began to go against the Catholic church, but guess what? They still kept the tenets of it. That's what this is saying. It says the Christian Sabbath too strongly, it says the Protestant world at its birth found the Christian Sabbath too strongly entrenched to run counter to its existence. It was therefore placed under the, the necessity of acquiescing in the arrangement, thus implying the church's right to change the day. In other words, they fell right in line with the Catholic church. For over 300 years, the Christian Sabbath is therefore to this day, the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Spirit without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. In other words, they said the Protestant Church, even though they divided, they came and, and, and branched off from the Catholic Church, they still stayed on cold. That's what this is saying. You guys see that? So when you hear people saying within the church, no, we're not like the Catholic church. No, we, we, we're not Catholics. As you see here, they fell in cold. When they broke off, they still fell in cold, on cold with the Catholic church. So they, the tenets that are in the Christian church is the tenets that originated in the Catholic church. All right. Let me give a couple of shout outs here real quick. All right. I see some um, new um, uh, super chats here. Damon Matthews want to thank you for the love and support. Thank you for being a voice for Israel outside of all the camp rhetoric. Hey, I appreciate the love and support. Really, thank you for the um, the blessings tonight. And we're just going to keep moving forward. And, we'll, and we, ju we just have to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters. You know what I mean? Uh, the Most High is going to eventually do. Uh, he's going to eventually I believe all of us on the right path. When he, when that horn blow, when he's, when, when, when we get to that point of mourning and crying out and all that, we, 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 I, but my belief is that many of us will get it right. We're getting it right right now. So we'll continue to pray for our brothers and sisters uh, as we move forward. But thank you for the love and support. Damon Matthews really appreciate you. Uh, Majestic minister. Thank you for the love and support with the super sticker family. Let's show some love for um, Majestic Minister, uh, Damon Matthews, again, Sab Sister Sabrina Richardson, uh, Sister Cheryl Steele, and Brother Douglas. Let's show some love for all of them for their love and support. Really appreciate the love and support tonight. All right. So family, as you see here, we, you know, we proved with these sources that uh, the Christian church that came from up under the Catholic church, they fell right in code. They fell right in line, alignment with the Catholic church. All right. That's what this is giving us proof of that. Okay. Right. So again, this teacher most emphatically forbids any change in the day for paramount reasons. The command calls for a perpetual covenant. The day commands to, commanded to be kept by the teacher has never once been kept, thereby developing an apostasy. So this is saying that, look, when they say the day commanded to be kept by the teacher has never once been kept. This is saying that the most high, this is dealing with, with the father, his son. Th th we're supposed to be honoring his laws, statutes and commandments. Christ said, if you love me, guess what? Keep my commandments. Guess what? He's echoing the very things the, the Most High has said in Exodus, you know, loving him and keeping his commandments. How the, how, there's a, how the Most High will what? Favor us. Loving and keeping Yah's, loving Yah by way of keeping his commandments. Guess what? Christ taught from Torah. That is a Torah principle. 
all right? Thereby developing an opacity from an assumable, um, assumably fixed principle as self-contradictory, self-stultifying, uh, and consequently as suicidal as it is within the power of language to express. So they making it clear. They making it clear. They making it clear. They're making it clear. All right, let's fast forward, family, because this is a lot to uh, read here, but I'm just giving you, and I'll drop some of these sources inside the comment section so you guys could go back and read at your leisure. Matter of fact, let me copy this over so that way you guys can do so. And then we'll continue here. Let me copy a couple of these sources over. And I encourage you, family, you know, get these sources, get these sources, vet the sources. So that way you know and understand that this is not something that I am just making up. Vet the sources. Make sure that I'm, I'm keep keep me honest. Make sure that I'm not misrepresenting any of the sources that are being shared. So let me drop this inside the comment section. You guys know I like to share sources. All right, let's put that in here. All right. I'm not sure if this would be large and uh, if it may be too large, but let's see. All right, family, that's the source that's on the screen here. I encourage you guys to uh, purchase the source uh, and, 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 and do your due diligence. Just go further with the vetting of the information. All right. So let's go to another source and I'll copy this in here that I'm getting ready to cover. And some of you guys may already be familiar with this. All right, let me put this here. And I want to say this for um, J. Michael, who, say, uh, who uh, honored to pass over uh, too early, but at least you're making an effort. That's 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 where I'm at with it. You know, because when we started honoring the Passover, we didn't have the dates right. But guess what? I know the Most High honored it because, again, he knows our intentions. And, and he knows that we're on this quest for truth, that as long as we continue to study, to show our, ourselves approved it to him, he'll open it up just like he did for us. So you just continue to press. Don't, don't kick yourself um, if you honored it too early, but you made the effort. Hallelujah. 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 All right. So let's go to this next source here. Let's go to this next source. This is the Converse Catechisms of uh, Catholic Doctrine by Peter Greerman, 1937. All right, let's look at this, this source here. What does the Catholic Church say about the feast days? Notice what it says about the feast days. It's going to quote the commandments, even though it's out of sync. But notice what they say here. Holy days of devotion, feast days, which we are recommended to keep holy. Holy days of obligation, days we must keep as Sunday. So notice what they says. Feast days, which we are recommended to keep holy, holy. So they saying the feast days that the most high said keep uh to keep holy is just a recommendation. It's not a commandment, it's a suggestion. It's 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 recommended. It's like, hey, I encourage you to keep it, but it's not mandatory, right? But it says here, holy days of obligation, days which we must keep as Sundays. All right. So which is the day? I mean, which is the Sabbath day? Just as a question that the source asked. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? This is coming di directly out of this book. Notice what it says, right? The third commandment, and we know this is not the third commandment. Actually, this is the uh, fourth commandment, actually the fifth commandment, right? But anyway, uh, notice what it says here. What is the third commandment? The third commandment is, remember that thou keep holy the sabbath day all right and it goes on to say which is the sabbath day saturday is the shabbat day or the sabbath day why do we observe sunday instead of saturday now you you see what it's saying here they make it clear what the shabbat day is but look notice what they say here 
We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because of the Catholic Church and the Council of Leo, Leo, uh, Laodicea, or Laodicea, excuse me if I butchered the name, in AD uh, 336. So we see that they're making it clear at the council in th uh, 336 AD is where they agreed, even though the edict was already passed in 321 by Constantine, but they're making it clear here. They're saying, hey, you know, at this particular council, is when they began to honor it. It says transfer uh, for the sol um, solemn, uh, sol solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So transfer the solemnity um, from Saturday to Sunday. So why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? This is still from their source. By what authority did the church substitute Saturday for Sunday? Still according to their source. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? Right. The church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday and the Holy Ghost. Not even getting into that. The Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. So they said that, see, and what they're saying is they're saying Christ. Rose on a Sunday. Right. <laughs> and. 50 days later, rose on a Sunday, the math doesn't add up. The math doesn't add up, family. You cannot rise on a Sunday and 50 days later, rise on a Sunday. 50 days later would be a Monday. <laughs> so their, their math is all messed up. But anyway, by what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday. The church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plenitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. Absolute lie. You know that Christ did not give the Roman Catholic Church power. The word church didn't even exist in the biblical times during the, uh, the Messiah uh, when he Christ walked the earth. And he wasn't referring to an institution. When your translation say on this rock, I will build this church, build my church, actually to really understand the fullness of the text, you have to go to the word ecclesia or ecclesia. Some would say ecclesia or ecclesia. But when you go there in the in-depth definition, it makes it clear the called out assembly of Israel, the Israelites. And you can see that in Exodus chapter 12, I believe around verse five or six, you'll see ha Kal Kwahal uh Yashara. Right? So ha kal kwahal ha adaf, excuse me. Right? Yashara al, right? The whole assembly or of witnesses, right? The Israelites, the whole, the ha ho kal assembly kwahal. The ha witnesses, right? Idaf uh, of uh, of the Israelites. So Yasharala. Anyway, so according to the Catholic Church, the commandment for the Shabbat, written in this in the covenant, hinders Sunday worship. That's what they said. According to the Catholic Church. The commandment for the Shabbat written in the covenant and the scriptures hinders Sunday worship. So they make it clear in the, inside their source that the Shabbat, the, the, the Sunday worship clashed with the Shabbat. The, uh, the uh, uh, Catholicism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism declare war on the true descendants of the ancient Israelites. But let's go back here. They made it clear here. You see, did I put it here? I thought I had it here. If not, we'll continue. Let's see. I thought it was here. Anyway, it's in the book. I, did, I, I thought I put it inside here. All right. But nevertheless, they make it clear.
All right. Anyway, I thought I had it in here is in my other presentation and then copy all, all the slides over. But anyway, family, you guys get the gist of it. All right. So again, as you see, I gave you sources. I gave you nothing but sources that the Roman Catholic Church had no power. They made it clear in the sources that I share with you guys that there's not one line of text that substantiate Sunday worship that gave them the authority to do what they did. All right, so let's continue here. Let's start with Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32. Let's start, let's get here, right? Let's let this be our foundation of scripture. Actually, I thought, why didn't I? Oh, this is out of whack. Let me make sure, let me get the scripture here real quick. Don't like my slides to be out of whack like this. All right. My apologies, family. I'm all over the place here. Leviticus. I thought I had it in here. All right. I'm just going to remove it for now and we'll go, we'll go, we'll, we'll go back to it. I thought I had it in here though. Let me look one more place and we'll, we'll continue here. I want to make sure I have all my slides here. Bear with me one second family. All right. So I believe it came out of this lesson right here. There will be one second family. Let me see if I can pull it up here. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It is what it is, family. I can bring it and put it in here, but it'd take a little time. And I just don't want to take away from what we're doing here. I thought I had it in here. All right. Yeah. Actually, that slide is out of whack. So I'll I'll just move this here. That's what it is. Let me correct it real quick. So that shouldn't be there. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, that shouldn't be there. I'm just deleting it all together. It shouldn't have been there. Just wanted to make sure. All right. So let's continue here, family. My apologies. I wanted to make sure the slides were in order. So what's special about the third day? All right. Let's deal with this here now. Let's deal with the third day, the three days. OK, let's deal with this third day. What's good? What's special about the third day? All right. Now. When you understand Hebrew, right. The Gamal and the Israeli, they call it the Gamel. Right. But the third the number three, right? The Gamal, right? That letter means maturity. Also sustained, but it also means maturity. So that third day is special. So how the church, and these are some of the methodologies of how they try to explain force, uh, the forcing a day and a half into uh, three days into a day and a half, they'll say, hey, uh, regardless if there was only if there was only five minutes in one day, like let's just say day one, day one, if it was only five minutes that um, that that was experienced in that one day, it still counts for a full day. Right. And then they'll, they'll say that for Friday. They'll say, hey, even if it's just for an hour, those three hours, that still counts for a full 24 hour cycle. Right. And then they'll say Saturday, Shabbat, that's a full 24 hour cycle. And then regardless, they can't tell you what time in the morning that he rose. But regardless, he was early in the morning that they believe on Sunday morning. They count that as a uh, a three day cycle. That's how they come up. That's some of their math. That's way out in left field. All right. But let me give you the answer with scripture. What is special about the third day? Let's let's go ahead and go into the scriptures. 
All right. Hosea chapter six, starting at verse one, it says this. Come, let us return. Show up. Right. Turn back to the true definition of the word convert is to what? Return to the father, not a practice of religion. All right. So come, let us return unto Yahweh, for he hath torn Tarap and he will heal Rapa us. He uh, hath smitten and he will bind Kabash us up. Let me read it again. Come, let us return unto Yahweh, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. Verse two, after two days, will he revive us? And we see the word Kai or Kaya, revive us. And it also transliterates to resurrection, right? But after two days, he will revive us. Interesting is that you don't see the word resurrection in what they call the Old Testament. I like to refer to the Old Testament as the established covenant. But it's interesting. You will, you will not find the word resurrection in it. If you have the KJV Bible, if you have some of these translations, you will not find resurrection in the Old Testament. You know why? Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. So after two days, will he revive us in the third day? He will raise us up. And this is where you see when many will say Quam or uh, uh, Yashara, it means rise up. He will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So after two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he'll raise us up. So in, on the second day, Right. He says, revive us. So he'll start breathing the breath of life like he did Adam in the very beginning. Right. He'll start what? Giving us what is called uh, what we call today in the medical terms CPR. CPR is not you just breathing breath, blowing breath inside someone's nostrils or mouth one time. You it's a continuous process until the person start breathing on their own. And then it says, in the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So what is the meaning of resurrection? <laughs> right. See, that's a powerful that's a powerful prophecy right there. And see what the church will tell you. They'll try to tell you that the three day prophecy of Christ. Being uh, in the grave or the sepulcher. For three days and three nights, they'll tell you it's a uh, it's a a um, a metaphor. You know, the other word I'm trying to look for, look for um, an allegory. But they won't say anything about the 40 days, 40 nights being an allegory. They won't say any of those other days, but when it comes to the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection, they'll say that it's an allegory. I'm telling you, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. So, let's see what we see here. All right. So, uh, what is the meaning of resurrection? Let's see what resurrection means. We're going to bring all of this together, family. The Greek definition of resurrection, let's see, it started with the Greek, right? Anastasi, it says this, uh, a standing up, again, an example literal, a resurrection from death, right? In other words, individual, genitive, or by implication, its author or figurative, a moral recovery, raised to life again, resurrection, rise from the dead, that should rise Rising again. So again, Anastasi means a standing up again, recovery, raised to life again, rising again. So I want to say it one more time. Resurrection, Anastasi means standing up again, recovery, raised to life again. 
when we go to the Hebrew dictionary definition of re resurrection, kaya, this is what it means. And notice you don't see the word resurrection. It's interesting, right? But, um, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. I'm going to do a special lesson on that. But anyway, kaya, it says here to revive, give life, give promise life, recover, repair, restore, in other words, to life, revive, behold, right? Quite simply, when you start understanding uh, key words and how they transliterated, it's to push an agenda. The Roman Catholic Church did not want to include the law and the prophets. In other words, the Torah, they did not want to um, include the law and the prophets, which is uh, today is called the Old Testament. They didn't want to initially include that. They want to have the gospels or the good news, you know, the testimonies of the disciples, Paul's writings. They wanted to just have that and whatever extra uh, so-called apostolic writers that's pretty much writing doctrine, uh, foundation doctrinal for the church. They wanted that to be their canonical books. All right. So again, let's go back here. Haya means to revive, give life, give promise life, recover, repair, restore to life, revive, be whole. Understand this family. Be whole means that you are healed in every aspect of your life. Like the woman, he touched me, he, right? She touched him and was made whole. In other words, was healed in every aspect of her life. But anyway, resurrection again, kaya means to restore to life. It means to revive. The Messiah gave a key prophecy here of resurrection, kaya, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. Notice what it says here. But he answered and said unto them, and an evil and adulterous generation seeketh at the what? A sign. So you have people seeking at the sign. These these uh, Israelites, right, they were seeking after a sign. They was putting the Messiah on the spot and said, uh, and this is what he said. And there shall no sign of, of be given unto it, but the sign of, of the prophet Jonah. So Christ is saying, hey, you want a sign? I'm only going to give you one sign. And that sign is going to be the prophet, of, the, the sign of the prophet Jonah. What was that sign? Verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Christ said, I'm not giving you a, no signs, but one sign, the sign of Jonah. Three days, three nights. Now, family, is this is he referring to three full days or is it day and a half like the church teach? Is this Christ giving them three full days, 24 hour days and nights? Because I've, 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 I'm going there. The reason why I say day and nights, because some when you say day they take that out of context. So we say day, 12 hours in a day, 12 hours in the night, right? But anyway, we know what the prophecy says, but see, some within the church will try to cover up and try to still push this day and a half uh, argument by saying it was it, it's an allegory. One of the ministers in our ministry was witnessing to someone and ask the person if your job told you on Friday that stay home for three days, don't come back until three three days later, what day are you going to return? And they lied and said they'll return on Sunday to try to justify the day and a half. Come on, family. Come on, family. What day would you return if on Friday your, your job told you to take the next three days off? <laughs> you want to stay home for 72 hours. You're not showing up. If he tell you to take three days off, you're not leaving work and showing up the day after 
or two days after or a day and a half after. Anyway, but that's some of the things that uh, many people do to try to hold on to a lie. OK. All right. So why or should I say what day was the Messiah? You know, was he restored? What day was the Messiah restored to life? Let me correct that slide. See, it's, it's good that we're walking through this mess, you know, because sometimes I have typos and and miss them. So let me correct it as we progress. All right. All right. Let me make sure I start. Oh, here it is. All right. Let me correct this here. All right. They, there it is. That's better. That's better. I had to correct it. So what day was the Messiah restored to life? OK, what day was Hamashiach, you know, up again? All right. We went to Hosea. That gave you gave you a major nugget of the process. But anyway, how important is it to know this information? Right. The Messiah being raised up again, Kaya, is very important to the restoration of hope to a dead people. That resurrection is for us, family, to give us hope that uh, our people who are suffering from Ezekiel 37. Come on, family. We're the only people, actually, not just us, but I'll say everyone that's, that, that's scattered abroad, we're, we're dealing with being cut off from our parts. Now, guess what? Now, we have brothers and sisters that don't even want to deal with us. That's in that's scattered around this di diaspora. You have some that 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 don't want to deal with us. Come on, I grew up in the the metropolitan up north, New York, New Jersey area. You got people in other places and other groups that look like you and I that don't that tell their children not to even come near us. So the Messiah being raised up again is very important to. The rest to the restoration of hope to a dead people. We are lost. That's what Ezekiel chapter 37. Israel cried out. We are lost. We are cut off from our parts. Are we not cut off from our parts? Did not the crafty council uh, honor or, and fulfill their promise in, in the 83rd book of Psalms to make sure that our name, the name Israel, is no longer in remembrance? They know who we are, but we lost memory. We lost sight of who we are. But guess what? The most high man, <laughs> he always have a ram in the bush for his people. All right. So. What is a day and when did it start according to scripture? See, we got to go. I know some of you guys are saying, Pastor, why you got to go this basic? But we got to go basic like this. What is a day? What's a day? And when did it start according to scripture? See, we have to go off the scriptures. I'm not going off of second and third party sources. We're going to let the scriptures tell us what a day is. Let's go to Genesis chapter one, starting at verse five. It's going to define when a day start and when it ends. Starting at verse five, and Allah called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Because guess what, family? In the beginning, as you see here, in the beginning, Allah created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So in this planet, in this what we call earth, darkness existed before the Most High said, let there be light. So from the evening, come on, family, the day starts with what? The evening. Is that simple, family? Is that that's that's real simple. And I want to say shout outs to Fanny 55 for the love and support. Thank you, Fanny 55, for the love and support, family. Show Fanny some love here. Really appreciate the love and support. All right. So, family, is it straightforward? The evening and the morning were the first day, right? We're just going to keep it simple. Now, let's go to Leviticus 23, 
verse 32. And this is the point that I was making even in the evening. Notice what it says here. It shall be unto you a Shabbat of rest and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even to even shall ye celebrate your Shabbat. So that's a full 24 hour cycle. That's all that is saying. A full cycle. The night and the day, not just the day portion or just the night portion, but the full cycle. OK, so how many hours in a day? Now, I know this is basic, but I got to ask this question. Right. I got to ask the question, how many hours in a day did the Messiah know the number of hours in a day? All right, family. Asking the question to you, family, did the Messiah know that there I mean, how many hours that there were in a day? I know because sometimes we can get so deep that we're just on the surface. We could get so deep. And, and if you're not careful, family, I, and I understand, I get it. Many of you guys are coming out of the church, waking up and you pull it from different directions. You know, you thinking that, the, that some of the channels that you're going to, they're giving you sound information, but they're all over the place. Come on, fam. Don't 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 feel bad. See, I'm a pastor. And guess what? I, you know, I'm, I'm well studied. Right. So, of course, I bet everything. Right. I even had to correct myself. All right. So I'm not making it seem as if I'm, I was free from correction. I had to correct myself. Well, actually, I'm not going to say I correct myself. The father corrected me through his Holy Spirit. All right. So I want to say shout outs to Yah's, uh, Yah's daughter. Thank you for the love and support. Family, let's show Yah's daughter some love tonight for the love and support. All right. Really appreciate you. Thank you for the love, the love and support. Been really been one of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, family members here that's been um, supporting us on a regular basis. And I thank you for the love and support. Really appreciate you. All right. So I know this is a basic question, family, but I have to ask the question. Did the Messiah know the number of hours in a day? And we're going to say. We're going to answer this question with scripture. Let's go to John chapter 11, starting at verse nine. And let's see what it says. And Yahweh Shai answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? Now, some would take this and say, see, he's saying that there's 12 hours in the whole 24 hour cycle, the day and the night. No, that's not. read the scripture here. He's dealing with the day portion of the day. The day, the light portion of the day. All right. Notice what it says. Are there not 12 hours in a in the day? And here's the kicker. This is where he's dealing with the light portion of the day. Notice what it says. If any man walk in the day, he not stumble, stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. So guess what? So he's making a distinction between the day that you can literally see or that you can walk around without stumbling because when you and i'm not sure if you guys have been in that area of the world i have from being in the military and you guys i'm telling you man you could go on places that it's pitch black that you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face literally now of course we're living in the day and time technology Lighting is in a lot of places, but man, there's some places you cannot see your hand in front of your face. Man, you could go to Las Vegas. You drive outside of Las Vegas. There's some patches on that road that if you pulled over and turned off your lights, you would not be able to see your hand in front of your face unless you're trying to look up at the stars and see something for from it. All right. So now. How, we just prove we're proving that he's dealing with the light portion of the day, because guess what? When we go to verse 10, it makes it clear that he's dealing with the light portion of the day. Twelve hours in the day. If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. But he's making a distinction 
12 hours in the light portion of the day. So, of course, 12 hours in the what? Dark portion of the day. I'm just saying it that way so that way it's, 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 it's simple, right? To keep it simple, all right? So let's see here. So Hamashayak understood time. Let me say that again. Newsflash, Hamashayak understood time. Yawam, okay? So how many days... How many days does 72 hours add up to? How many days is 72 hours? I know this is simple, but how many days is 72 hours? Because Christ was very clear with his prophecy about Jonah. He said three days, three nights, three light portion, 12 hour light portions of the day, 12 Three day, I mean, 12, three night portions of the day. Those are full 24 hour cycles. All right. So, family, now we agree. Christ is clear that he understands how to tell time. Right. We can't, we can't, we can't take away from the scriptures. John chapter 2, verse 19 and 21. I'm mean, through 21. Notice what it says. Yahawashai answered and said unto them, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. Now, he gave us something to go off of. He started off by saying what? He said that. In a nutshell, he referred to the prophecy of Jonah. Three days, three nights. He made it clear that he knew how to tell time. Right. But he said, I'm going to give you one sign. And that sign is three days and three nights. He said the prophecy of Jonah. So he made it clear three full 24 hour cycles. And guess what? When we go back to it, and I'm just going to go back. here. I want to make sure we we're all on the same page. If we go back to Hosea. After two days, will he be revived And the third day? He will he will raise us up. Come on, family. That's still stand within the stand within the scriptures. All right. And then when we go back to Jonah, the prophecy of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You can't get around that. And then again, let's go back here. Because the Messiah know how to tell time. The Messiah know how to, he knows how to tell time. We just proved it, but let's go back again. I just want to make sure we all together. Are there not 12 hours in the day? Now he's going to make it clear the light portion of it. If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not. The light portion of the day, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. OK, how much I got understood time and we answer this question. So going back here, John, chat, um, going back to John, he says, yeah, how was I answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Israelites, right, then said the Israelites. 40 and six years, it took 46 years, it says, was the temple in, temple and building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake not, he said, but he spake of the temple of his body. So they were looking at it literal, like, man, he talking about tearing down something that took six years to build. He's talking about tearing it down and raising it back up in three days. But they didn't understand that he's referring to his body, his life. So now let's go ahead and we we, we painting this all together, family. We're bringing this all together, right? We're bringing this all together. I know we're giving a lot of information, all right? When is the ninth hour? When is the ninth hour? When is the ninth hour? Hmm. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 46. Let's see what it says. And about the ninth hour, Yahawashai cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. 
All right. And I want to make this clear. This is this has nothing to do with uh, 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 Sabbath keepers, because I know some are pushing the the, the doctrine that this is dealing with um, Sabbath or Shabbat. All right. And I can tell you that's not a Sean in the Hebrew. But anyway, so in about the ninth hour, Yahweh Shai, Jesus the Christ, cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Laba, Sabachthani. That is to say, Maya, Maya, why hast thou forsaken me? Wait a minute, but he's supposed to be the father, right? You know, when you start dealing with many of these people in, in the church, baby, baby father Jesus, he is the literal father, but he's praying to the father. He's praying to himself. Anyway, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called it for Elias, right? So let's go to Mark chapter 15, starting at 34, verse 34. We're just confirming this. Each one of them going to confirm the same thing. And at the ninth hour, Yahweh Shai cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. All right. So we see he's saying the same thing. So now when we go to the 22nd book of Psalms, Verse one, let's confirm this, right? Remember what I said here, we're confirming to make sure that this has nothing to do with Shabbat. My God, in other words, Alai, Alai, or you could say Alaya, Alaya, almost sound like what? Elijah, Ilaya, Ilaya. That sound like Elijah, right? Allah, someone will cut this off and silence this to say Eli, but no, we're saying this from ancient Hebrew. Alaya, Alaya, Lama, I Zabathani. Right? I Zabath. This is not Shabbat here. Za, that's a Zion. Zabath. Nai. Or you say I Zabathani. Or I Zabathanaya. <laughs> Come on, family. Man, come on. Do, do you love the family when the when, when you see the harmony of the text? <laughs> All right, Sister Carol. All right. This is this is for you, Sister Carol. Right? This is for you, Sister Carol. I was like, a hop, a hop. You know, girl, right? oh no. Exactly. Right? And the bird did what? Ooh, I said, uh, bird, get back. Fly up, fly away. Yeah. Be gone. Bye. Up in the sky. Nice try. Bye. <laughs> That's for you, Sister Carol. Since you want to bring the chair out. <laughs> but anyway, all right. So, <laughs> all right. So, just want to show you guys that, uh, the harmony of the text. All right. So Alaya, Alaya, Lama, Izabat, Thani. All right. So a key to understanding the biblical hours. Let me give you a key here to understand the biblical hours. Now, this is a sundial, right? The Qumran sundial that was found with the Qumran text, right? You know, and yes, family, they had sundials right i did a video about cat williams wearing a compass watch that you know when you start taking it all the way back to like the um uh the sumerians and all of that right uh but that's a whole nother discussion not getting into all of that but guess what they had sundials they had things that they told time with it's not a sin to wear something that tells time right is what you do with it that makes it a sin Right. Anyway, so the Qumran sundial. Right. And I want you to pay attention to how this. Looks OK. So the Qumran sundial, the identification of the object as a sundial was based on a publication of the shrine of the book in Jerusalem, where most of the intact Dead Sea Scrolls are kept. This supposed sundial was found at the same time as the ancient scrolls. And at first, archaeologists thought it was a simple 
I was I thought it was simply a stone disc. Come on, family. They thought that this was simply a stone disc, but you see these markings on it. You see these carvings on it. All right. It was locked away in a vault until recently being rediscovered where it was found to be a sundial. Although previous timekeeping methods and charts were found at the Qumran site, the discovery of this small sundial provides further evidence of the Qumran interest in the measurement of time. At the bottom of the dial, in the part that remains hidden when it stands on a flat surface, the form of the Hebrew letter, ayan, right? And you know, in the um, Hebrew, the ayan is shaped like an eye, a circle can be seen measuring about um, one by one centimeters. The letter stands close to the center of the disc, disc excuse me. No uh, explanation for this find has yet been suggested. But anyway, so let's deal with some of the other dials that we, you know, just give you an example of some of the dials that was used back in the time of some of our ancestors, right? You have what is called the dial of, Ahaz, the dial of Ahaz, okay? We see this in scripture. In Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, what shall be the sign to Yahweh will heal me and that I shall go up into the house of Yahweh the third day. See, you see that third day, right? We still dealing with uh, that threes, right? You know, I know some some people don't, you know, don't want to grab hold of the understanding that the third day has a significance because we just hit the third day again. Let me do something real quick. Let me make sure I, I'm on the right slide. All right. All right. Let me do something real quick. All right. Just making sure I got everything lined up. All right. Bear with me one second, family. Let me do something real quick. Just fixing the slide here. Oh, I'll fix it another time. I guess I can't fix it right now, but it, oh well. But anyway, all right. So let's go to Isaiah again. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, what shall be the sign that Yahweh will heal me and that I shall go up into the house of Yahweh the third day? And Isaiah said, this sign shall thou have of Yahweh, that Yahweh will do this, the thing that he hath spoken, shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees. And Hezekiah answered, it is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. So now we see what time going back, reversing time, 10 degrees. That's like 10 hours. And Isaiah, the prophet cried unto Yahweh, and he brought the shadow 10 Ishar degrees backwards by which it had gone down in the dial Ma'al Wath of Ahaz, Akaz. All right. So we see the dial of Ahaz again, Ma'al Wath, Akaz, right? The dial of Ahaz. So we see a dial here, a sundial here. The Israelites had instruments to tell time. Now, this letter here that you saw at the beginning that I said I will, will explain, this is the quap, right? The meaning of this letter is circle, horizon, balance, and the numerical value is 100. I'll say it again. Numerical value is 100. It's called the quap. We're dealing with ancient Hebrew. Circle, horizon, balance. Now, in order to see the horizon, because right now it looks almost like a lollipop, right? So what we're going to have to do is see this is the pictograph of it. Now we see it looks like a sunset or a sunrise. All right. So I rob, right? That'll be here the evening. Right. Bakar will be over here. 
will be the morning. Arab Bakar. Yala, 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 I can't even say it. La Yala will be the height of the night. Yawan will be the height, the hottest part of the day. All right? So Arab evening, right? Bakar, in Israeli, some of you guys will say Bokar, Boker. But anyway, I'm saying this in ancient Hebrew. So this is be, these are the two transitional parts of the day. So this looks like it could be a sunrise or a sunset, right? So when we go back here, right now I turned it 45 degrees to the uh, left. And now we could get a clarity here. We can now use this as what? A sundial. Now, if I go back here, let me see if I go back. You see the background here? That eclipse with the, uh, what uh, when you trace over, you see the uh, Alap, which is the first letter of the Hebrew al alphabets. In the Israeli, it's pronounced Aleph. And then you'll see the Tha. Many will pronounce it Tov in the Israeli. Um, again, I'm doing ancient Hebrew, the Tha, right? But this looks like when you put this in a circle directly over this moon, You'll see that this also can be used as the Tav or the not Tav, but the Hwap. So again, evening, Arab. Now we see the ninth hour here. So the ninth hour is 3 p.m. on the Gregorian calendar. So this will be the ninth hour right here. The ninth hour would be 3 p.m. on the Gregorian calendar. All right. So let's go to Luke chapter 23, verse 44. Let's confirm this. And it was about the sixth hour. And there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. So it was about what? The sixth hour. So the sixth hour is 12 noon. All right, let's go back here. We see the ninth hour. Now we see the sixth hour, which be which uh, the sixth hour would be what? Twelve noon. The ninth hour will be three noon. Three, uh, three, uh, three, not three noon, but, you know, you guys know what I mean. It'll be three, uh, th the third hour. Right. So here, when we get to the twelve, this will actually be the sixth hour, according to the Gregorian calendar. This is this is Irab right here. The evening. This is the tr there's two transitional points of the day, the evening. And on this side will be the morning. This will be Bakar. Irab Bakar. Evening day. All right. So we see the sixth hour and we see the ninth hour. OK, so what time did Hamashayak die? Well, Shortly after the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m., right? Shortly after the ninth hour, which would be shortly after the third hour. Let's go to Luke chapter 23, starting at verse 45. I mean, 44. Let's confirm this. And it was about the sixth hour. And, and there was a darkness over the over all the earth until the ninth hour. So from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was a three hour period of darkness. Still dealing with what? That three, right? That third letter, Gamal. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Yahweh had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, wait a minute. Is he talking to himself, family, or is he referring to the father, the literal father? How can Christ be the literal father? And he's uh, praying to the father, saying, into the father's hand, I commend my spirit. So, again, according to the church. Father, baby, Jesus is talking to himself here. All right. All right. I want to just make it clear here. I'm not dealing with the book of Enoch. Um, let's 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 keep that. Uh you know, respectfully, I, I, I don't endorse the book of Enoch. So let's not, you know, and that's a whole nother teaching. And I have the teaching here. So let's let's uh, let's keep that book of Enoch stuff somewhere else. I don't endorse the book of Enoch. We're, we're dealing with scripture, the foundational text here. 
So let's not bring the book of Enoch here. And I removed the comment because I don't want to bring none of that confusion here. Uh, bookie, um, uh, the book of Enoch is, is, is anyway, I'm not going to get into all of that. So let's be, let's, let's stay, uh, stay on code here and let's deal with the, the, the books that we have right in front of us. I'm not dealing with the book of Enoch, Eli, I mean, Enoch. I'm, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to defer, uh, ref, um, defer to the foundational scriptures that we have in front of us. And again, Enoch is not, it's not that that's a whole nother whole nother dynamic but anyway and yahweh shai had cried with a loud voice he said father into thy hands i commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up the spirit okay so hamashayak's death was shortly after the ninth hour all right so now we we go right back to this letter that's why i say it's all in the letters 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 all right it's all in the letters is we're using this letter as a compass we're using this letter as a compass okay so again the sixth hour is 12 noon right on the gregorian calendar the ninth hour is the third hour on a gregorian calendar all right so again this gives you an illustration and we're using this letter because this letter is actually a compass the quap is actually a compass okay so why was there a sense of urgency and taking Hamashiach down from the cross. So again, you know, there was a period of darkness, right? This three-hour period right here of darkness. So now he died just after the ninth hour. So that would be this window right here. So now there is a rush during this period to get the, to take him down off the cross. Now, why is that? Why was there a sense of urgency to take him the Messiah off down off the cross. Deuteronomy 21 gives the answer, starting at verse 22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be uh to be put to death, and thou hanged him on a tree, here's the kicker: his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of Allah, that thy land be not defiled, which Yahweh Allah giveth thee for an inheritance. So it's again, if anybody uh, that they have uh, applied uh, or hanged or capital punishment, right, and they left them up, they will curse the land. They will curse all of Israel. The land will be cursed. That's what this is saying. So guess what? There's a judgment that's coming to this country. There's a judgment that's coming to the French. There's a country that's coming to the Brits. There's a country, I mean, a judgment that's coming to every country that have committed these heinous crimes to our people. It's not just the United States. Every country that have hanged our people Guess what? They have hung us, left us hanging to dry. They didn't even have the uh, uh, the honor, at least the respect to say, let me let me take them down. Let me bury them. Left them up on the trees. And this scripture makes it clear. That judgment is coming, family. Coming to every country. That did this to our people. So many of our ancestors were hanged and still being hanged, being lynched. So whether it's hanged, whether the murdered in the streets, there is a judgment coming. All right. So what day of the week did the first Passover occur? 
What day of the week did the first Passover occur? Let me say that again. What day of the week did the first Passover occur? Now we're getting ready to get into the, the deep here. All right. Any of you guys got to work in the morning? If any of you guys got to work in the morning, um, I encourage you guys to watch it in the, the, the replay. I don't have to I don't have to work in the morning, so I'm up late. <laughs> right. You know, uh, so we're going we're going to keep this going until we finish this portion up. All right. So with that being said, what day of the week did the first Passover occur? And this is important, family, because many of our brothers and sisters, right? They not many, yeah, I'm gonna say many, are going to honor Passover on the eighth, the eighth of April is actually a new moon. And this is important for you guys to understand this. Some have already honored the Passover, right? And that's not lining up with the scriptures. But again, we are making an effort. That's the key. We At least we're making an effort to, to do right. And the most high, he'll clean it up. All right. But anyway, let me see here. Let me see some of the comments here. I see uh, Victor said Wednesday. Famo said Wednesday. Uh, I mean, said Tuesday. Sister Carol, Wednesday. Let's see here. Uh, 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 Audi Rob, Thursday, Majestic Minister, Wednesday, J. Mike, uh, oh, yes, they got to watch it on a replay. Yeah, I understand. All right. Wednesday, okay. All right. All right, so I see one more comment here. Yara Shalom, right? That's Jerusalem family. For those that may not know, Yara Shalom, uh, Wednesday. And Mr. Lawrence, triple seven, Wednesday. Apostle elect, uh, Joan Messiah, Wednesday. Shout outs to you, Apostle. Peace and blessings to you. All right. All right. So now we're going to have to map this thing out. All right. I'm going to give you scripture. We're going to map this thing out. Let me give you proof. I don't want to just say something to you, but let me give you proof here. Right? Let's, 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 let's fast forward. All right, this is a duplicate here. Let me take this out. I don't want to go back over this here. Let me take this out, family. Didn't realize I had some duplicate slides here. Let me take this Constantine stuff out. All right. No, I'll leave it there because it's, it's still a reminder. So remember, family, Good Friday was created by Constantine. And I'm just going to leave it there because I know that we have some new people that may have joined. So Constantine created Good Friday. And that's where you see here. And at the same time, enjoined the observance of Friday in memory of the death of Christ. All right. So this is important to know. This is important to know. All right. So Hamashiach, right, he prophesied his own death. Right. He prophesied his resurrection as well. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. He gave a prophecy about his death, burial and resurrection. Do you guys remember this here? Again, I'm just reading it again. Just reiterating the point. Uh, he said, but he answered and said unto them, an evil adulterous generation after a sign off, there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he further gave clarity here in a nutshell. He says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right. So make a note of that. So seeking a sign. Right. Seeking signs from Yahweh is not a sin. Let me make that clear. Seeking signs. Of Yahweh is not a sin. The key is the motives behind those seeking signs 
that makes it a sin. Again, you have many people that is teaching prophecy, but guess what? They, their motives are off. The way they chasing after signs, but it's for mo ulterior motives. So again, seeking signs, a sign from Yahweh is not a sin. We see Gideon. It's the motives behind those seeking signs that makes it a sin. We can see Moses, all right? We got examples. How can we reconstruct the Hebrew calendar? That's the question. It starts with understanding the 360-day the calendar, right? There were three, uh, 30 cultures around the world that used 360-day year with 12-day, excuse me, 12, 30-day months, right? So over three, I mean, 30 cultures around the world their calendars, right? I'm not dealing with where the Hebrew calendar is today because they made some modifications to it. But the ancient Israelites, they, uh, when we go to Torah, you will see nothing but 30 day months. You will not find a 12th month. You know, some try to take scriptures and try to stretch it to say, and there's not a single passage that says 12th month, I mean, 13th month. So there were 30 cultures around the world that used 30, 360 day years. I mean, 360 day year with 12, 30 day months, right? The 360 day calendar, Hindu. Let's deal with the Hindus. And this is a great source here. Uh, Velikowski, Emmanuel, Worlds in Collision. And I'm going to drop this uh, source inside the comment section for those who would, may want to purchase it. This is a great source to help you get started. All right, let's see here. I'll just drop this source inside the comment section. And family, you have to invest. You have to invest in, you know, your education, you have to invest in your knowledge base. All right. You know, um, let's see here. All right. I put this source there so you can have it. All right. The text of the Vita period known a year of, of only 360 days. All Vita text speaks uniformly and exclusively of a 30, I mean, of a year of 360 days, passages in which the length of, or excuse me, this length of the years directly stated are found in the Brahmins or Brahmanas. All right. And it goes on to say, let us know, consists of 360 days. Nowhere, uh, nowhere refer to the five or six days that actually are part of the solar year. This Hindu year of 360 days is divided into 12 months of 30 days each. Excuse me. Excuse me. I had to um, clear my throat here. All right. All right. The Persians, using this source here, the ancient Persians year was composed of 360 days or 12 months of the of 30 days each in the seventh century five gathas or excuse me gatha days were added to the calendar in the uh bundi um bundi bundihis excuse me if i mis mispronounce this but on word a sacred book of the persians the 180 successive appearances of the sun from the winter solstice to the summer solstice and from the summer solstice to the next winter solstice. So this is still calculating this here. 180 plus 180 will give you 360. That's what this is saying. The Babylonians, 360 year, um, uh, 360 day calendars. The old Babylonian year was composed of 360 days. The astronomical tables or tablets from the period annotating the Neo-Babylonian empire compute the year at so many days without mention of additional days the uh that the ancient babylonian year had only 360 days was known before the cuneiform script was deciphered so this is giving us sources 
proven that the Babylonians had 360 day calendars, right? So the Egyptians had 360 day calendars. All right. The Egyptian year was composed of 360 days before before it became 365 by the additional uh, the addition of five days. OK. And it goes on to say. Uh, let me see here. The purpose of the decree, uh, this is dealing with the decree. So we still proven that it was 360 days. Let's see. I'm trying to see if anything else that I miss the Egyptians. All right. The authors of the decree did not specify the particular date on which the five days were added to the 360 days. But this is making it clear the initially the ancient Egyptians had 360 day calendars. Now, when we get to the ancient Israelites, the month of the Israelites from the 15th to the 8th century before the present era was equal to 30 days. In 12, month, 12 months comprised a year. There is no mention of months shorter than 30 days, nor of a year longer than 12 months. That the month was composed of 30 days is evidenced by uh, evidenced by Deuteronomy 34.8, Deuteronomy 21.13, Numbers 20.29, 20, where mourning for the dead is ordered for a full month and is carried on for 30 days. The story of the flood given uh, as given in Genesis reckons in months of 30 days. It says that 150 days pass between the 17th day of the second month and the 17th day. Of, well, I didn't put it all here, but this is giving you some samples here. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse eight. You see it right here, right? Uh, the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab. 30 days. All right. Deuteronomy 21, verse 13. We see another example here, right? And she shall put the raiment of her captivity off her and remain in the house and be well her father and mother a full moon. Oh, excuse me, a full month. I said moon, but a full month. Guess what? We're dealing with 30 days. Okay. Additional proof of Israel's 360 day calendar. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. It's right in front of us. A woman and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had hath a place prepared of Yahweh that they should feed her 2,000, right? 2,203 score days, right? So when we put that together, that's 1,260 days. Divide that by 30, right? That comes to 42, which means that this is three and a half years. So you can try it. If anyone can try it, they're different math, but you take 1,260 days divided by 30, you have 42 months. And that is proven. Uh, so, and, and, um, apostle, I'll, I'll deal with that another time. I know, cause I know that can be confusing. Like, Hey, where did that come from? See, as, as time began to progress, you had, especially when you start dealing with the Romans and, uh, the Greeks and some, you know, they began to, you know, you start seeing modifications. All right. You start seeing modifications, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Nah, that's not, that's, that's not, um, uh, 390 days in a year. I'm not sure what year you're using, but for Israel, I'm not dealing with any other calendar. I'm dealing with Israel. I'm dealing with scripture. There's not 390 days. You're not going to find a 300, nothing that's going to add up to 390 days in Torah. You're going to see 12, you're not going to see a 13th month, and you're not going to see a month longer or shorter than 30 days. So I'm not going to get into all that other stuff, but uh, but let's stay on what we're using. I'm not using uh, any of that other stuff. All right. So appreciate the participation, but let's let's keep that stuff out of here 
because I want to make sure we don't confuse the people. People are trying to get this, the, the basic understanding here. And I don't want to uh, uh, interject anything that's outside of Torah. We're using Torah. We're dealing with the ancient Israelites. So nevertheless, let's keep it moving. All right. So. 42. Right. Divided by 12. Equals three and a half years. Right. As we see here, 12, 1260 days. Divided by 30 equals 42. Then 42 divided by 12 is 3.5 years. So Israel used a 360 day year and 12 30 day month calendar. So we could, so again, reconstructing of the Hebrew calendar. These are some of the basic things that you guys have to understand that there was 12 months in a year. And also there was 30 day, uh, 30 day months. You grab hold of that. Don't 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 even get caught up with all the stuff that's been when you start getting into stuff that's been added centuries and centuries and centuries later. When we when we stick to what the scripture says, I can guarantee you, you will be able to take this and every year you will be able to pinpoint with accuracy when to celebrate the feast days. All right. When to honor the things of the most high. OK, so let's go ahead and continue. All right. In order to reconstruct the Hebrew calendar, we have to start by identifying the very first Shabbat, the first Shabbat. We need a, we, we need a uh, Shabbat that we can use as our anchor. And guess what, family? We have it. It's in the scripture. Now, if we go to Exodus chapter 16, right, starting at verse one. There's so many nuggets here. Because we don't see, we know that in the first month, right? It already highlights in the first month, right? Uh, the things for Israel to do in chapter 12. But we need to understand what was the Shabbat? What day did the Shabbat fall on? How do we reconstruct this calendar to prove what day the original Passover, Pesach fell on? Well, family, I'm going to show you the formula here. And they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So on the 15th day of the second month. So think about it. We're in the second month. The 15th day, but we still need to know what day of the week this is. We still need to know the day of the week it is. So on the 15th day of the second month, again, what's the significance about this 15th day? <laughs> right? Israel arrived in the wilderness of sin on the 15th day of the second month. The question is, is the 15th day a day of rest? Well, let's go to Exodus chapter, back to Exodus 16, but let's go to verse four. Let's see what verse four says. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove to them whether they will walk in my law or no, just tying into Deuteronomy 8, right? And also Christ quoted, right, from that passage. But anyway, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare and that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily, right? So guess what, family? The 15th day of the second month is a Shabbat, right? It is a Shabbat. But let's go back here, right? Because this is the day that Israel ended their, they, they stopped their travel, right? So it says, then saith Yahweh, behold, right? I will rain bread 
from heaven and the people shall go out and gather. So this is what the next day after they what stopped because they can't go out and gather on the Shabbat. Oh, yeah. I hope y'all grab hold of this. They were traveling, but they stopped on the 15th day. And the Most High has given them instructions that the very next day, the very next day, he's going to what? Bless them to where so they can go and pick. They're going to pick. They're going to have food to eat. All right. So let's go ahead and get, let's, let's bring this all together. Let's bring this all together. And this is just giving instructions on what's going to happen. It says, in the shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice. So he's giving them the instructions that on the first day of the week, right, they're going to, which will be the 16th, they're going to gather. So each day for six days, they're going to gather. But on, uh, on the sixth day, uh, which would be the sixth day of the week, they're going to gather du double on that particular day. So again, the 15th day of the second month is a Shabbat. So we just pinpointed one Shabbat. Technically, that's all we need because we know that there are, what, 30-day months. But let's go ahead and continue. So the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. They stopped. They rested on this day. On the 15th day of the month, they ceased. They stopped. They didn't travel. All right. So on the 15th day, Moses shared with Israel what to expect on the next day. Right. Verse six. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel at evening. Uh oh. So now at evening. So when they get to that evening, remember, a Israel day. A he ancient Hebrew day starts at even or the evening. So here it is on the 15th. They resting on the 15th, but at evening, as they get ready to transition, that evening, I rob transitions into another day. So now that evening would be the 16th going into the night portion of the day. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel at evening, then shall it said, then ye shall know that Yahweh hath brought you out of from the land of Egypt. Verse seven. And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of Yahweh for that he heareth Shammai or Shammai, your murmurings against Yahweh. And what are we that ye murmur against us? So he's saying, OK, the evening. Right. Presents a new day. Right. Going into a new day, the evening in that evening. I just want to stress the evening. Now he's saying the morning right after that night portion of the day, the morning. Right. Bakar. The most high is going to do some blessing um, um, great for them. Right. All right. I'm going to pass fast forward. I don't need to get into the morning, but I want to break this down real quick. So, again, at evening, I rob. Then shall, then ye shall know that Yahweh hath brought you out of the uh, out from the land of Egypt. So when we go back here, remember, he says at evening. So right now, this is the day portion of the fifteenth, right? Moses is gathering, is speaking to the people during this portion of the day, but he said at evening, which would be. Now going into another day, which would be the 16th. Uh oh, Israel's is being prepared on what to do. So, of course, by the time they get to this morning, right? By the time they get to this morning, he's telling them now they can gather <laughs> on the day portion of the 16th. All right. So again, at evening, then ye shall know that Yahweh hath bought you. All right, that's Exodus chapter 16, verse 6. 
So Moses and Aaron went before Israel and declared Yah's promise and instructions. In the evening, Arab, Yahweh would use his provisions to prove that it was he who saved them and brought them out of the land of Egypt or the Egyptian slavery. In the morning, Bakar, Yahweh would use his provisions to prove his glory. So on the next day, so this, this is the next day. Remember, we said the 16th is the next day. All right. On the next day at even, then ye shall know that Yahweh hath brought you. Right. And then we see here the evening of the 16th day as sundown began on uh, sundown, begin on uh, sundown, 6 p.m. on the Shabbat. Let me read that again. The evening of the 16th day begins at sundown, not as sundown. Let me correct that. It should be at sundown. Right. Of the 15th. So remember, as I shared here, Israel calendar starts in the evening. So it would be the evening on this day, right? Going into the evening would be the 16th, as I shared. All right. But anyway, and it came to pass that at even, now let's see what happened. And it came to pass that at evening, the quails came up and covered the camp. Oh, wait a minute. So at the evening, soon as that dial hit evening, now we're going into the 16th, which is the dark portion of the day. At evening, the quails came up and covered the camp. So at night, the quails, we see in a migration, a bird migration, the quails came. But in notice what it says is, and in the morning, the dew lay round about the host. Oh man, this is powerful. So it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, they gather, they, they double up. So on the 15th day of the second month, Israel was given instructions for the upcoming seven days. They were instructed to work the next six days, gather double on the sixth day and rest on the seventh day. On the 16th day of the sec, uh, second month, Israel witnessed the miracles of Yah executed Yah's instructions and began to gather manner for the next six days. So guess what? With that being said, we can now we can now put this to visual. So it came to pass that evening. So as we transitioned right from the 15th, once that evening hit, guess what? The quails came. Now let me give you a visual. Remember. This part of the day is the 15th. So when that evening came, this became the 16th. This is where the quails came in during this portion of the 16th. So when the morning of the 16th, this is where Israel began to gather. Right. So I just want to make sure you guys get the visual. So it came to pass at uh, came to pass that at evening, the quells came up. So at that at evening, right, that's the beginning of the 16th. So you guys can see the visual. That's when the quells came. Let me make sure we you guys follow me. All right. All right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Again, I'm not dealing with the Ethiopian Bible. I'm dealing with Torah. The Ethiopian Bible um, came about in the third century, the third to third, sixth century, um, third to fourth century. The Torah was already in place. There was nothing in Torah that suggested or even remotely talked about a 13th month. I'm not again, I'm not going to I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand. Uh, start with Torah. Your foundational book should be the first five books of the Bible. Once you start getting into all the other stuff, it's going to throw you off. Start with the first five books. And let that be your foundation. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to keep this simple. The first five books, I said this over and over again. Many of our brothers and sisters start reading all this other stuff. And I don't have a problem with the Ethiopian Bible, the Coptic Bible, all those other stuff books but they base their writings right they say everyone starts with the torah it's not the reverse so i'm you know keep it simple the book of enoch 
right? The book of Enoch doesn't trump the writings of Moses. The book of Enoch was written uh, a almost over, um, over a thousand years later. And it's filled with all kinds of um, mystical stuff, all kinds of errors. Right. And there's three different writings, um, three writings that consist of the book. You know, that's a whole nother discussion. So I'm going to say this to everyone that, are wa that is watching. Error on the side of caution default to Torah. I say this even for those that are reading Apocrypha. If you see something that seems or you believe it's a, a contradiction, error on the side of caution, the Torah prevails. You know, because if you do it reverse, it's going to confuse you. And that's what many of our brothers and sisters are doing. And I understand. And let me make this clear. I understand because you're trying to get caught up. But the key is you have to start with the foundation. How it helped me is I had to throw away all, I, my school books. You know what I mean? I threw away my school books. I threw away my school books. And I, and I literally kept going over and over. Torah, the, the law. Then I kept going over the good news, the testimonies of the prophets. I kept going back and forth. And once I got that down, that's why when I got to, what I'm teaching you is me taking the time out. Once I got that down and I saw that, wait a minute, there's no, wait a minute, there's no months that that's beyond 12. There's no days beyond 30. There's no days less than 30. Start with Torah. We're dealing with the ancient Israelites. We're not dealing with 2,000 years later, 3,000 years later. We're dealing with, with the ancient Israelites. I'm talking about Moses. I'm talking about uh, Abraham. We're talking about during those times. So I hope this helps. And I'm just trying to reiterate this point so that way you can really uh, to help you from, you know, to remove the confusion. And again, this is why so many of our people are getting confused because many are reading uh, these uh, these extra books and they haven't even read the first book. They're reading uh, these so-called lost books and they're not lost. They're reading these so-called lost books. They'll read the book of Jubilees. They'll read the book of Enoch. They'll read the multiple books of Jasher. But when you ask them, have you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy in its entirety? Every time it's always a no. Start, let this be your foundation. They don't trump. So that's why I want to make it make it easier on you. I, I really don't care about, you know, when you start getting into uh, the Ethiopian Bible and all that. I really don't care about those things because why I'm focusing on Torah. And that's what I want to reiterate. I don't care about what the Quran doing, because guess what? The Quran is a seventh century text. I'm going to the original text. I'm going to Torah. I'm going to hear directly from Masha. That's the ancient Hebrew word for my, Mo, Moses and the Israeli Moshe. I'm going to what the Most High have had, had, had to write down in those books. Let that be your foundation. Error on the side of caution. The caution is stick to Torah. Caution is any contradiction. Guess what? Torah holds weight. Christ did not teach out of the Ethiopian sources. He did not teach out of the, uh, let's be real, the KJV. He didn't teach out of any of those things. He taught out of the law and the prophets. That's in the scripture. Do exactly what Christ has said to do. Teach out of the law and the prophets. Do what Christ did. And you'll see, for example, Matthew chapter 24, I mean, 22, all through this, the, the testimonies, you'll see the law and the prophets. You don't see them make them. You, you'll see uh, um, uh, there's books that are mentioned. In the established covenant, but the primary books you see that them that they make mention the law and the prophets. All right, so I'm going to stop right there. I, I don't want to uh, prolong the hour by 
uh, harping on that, but I did want to reiterate that point. If you really want to get this, uh, get the understanding of this, stick to the first five books and the prophets to really understand this, to really start as your base and reading the good news, because as I just proved it, it lines up with Torah. All right. But nevertheless, it, it, let's keep it simple. All right. OK, so as you see again, family. Evening at this evening is when the 16th kicked in by the morning. This is where the dew. This is this is where Israel began to gather what the most high had brought over or uh, redirected to this area. So when we look at Numbers chapter 11, verse 31, guess what we're going to see? We see confirmation. And there went forth a wind from Yahweh who brought quails from the sea. And we can even confirm this, right? Right? A wind from Yahweh and brought quails, shalah, from the sea. This is describing a quail migration. All right? I'm not going to go too deep in this, but this is just proving quail migrations going to that portion of the uh, of, of Israel. But this is where you'll see the miracle here. As you, I'll just read a little bit of this. August marks the start of the annual migration of millions of birds from their European breeding areas to their wintering grounds in Africa. Many will fly across the eastern Mediterranean towards Egypt, where they will land exhausted on a coast along which, hundred, uh, which hundreds of kilometers are of trappers nets have been. So this is telling you normally during the August time frame, right? The time frame that we're looking at when we say the second month, actually we're dealing with, according to the Gregorian calendar, it would be the May time frame. So this is telling you the miracle. So this migration is saying it's, it happens in August, right? But we're seeing that a, a, a migration is happening in May. So three months earlier, we see that's where the miracle is. As you see here, it's saying what? August marks the start of the annual month. So in the fifth day for Israel, right? But they this migration occurred in the second month. I hope you guys grab hold of that. All right? It goes on to say, these nests will catch at least 150 million birds this year. According to the biologist estimate, more than one in 20 of the migrant birds leaving Europe for Africa. All right. So there is an ancient Israel city in the territory of Judah. Guess what? The people eat chicken, right? Quail and chicken is part of the same family. Because I know we got brothers and sisters saying don't eat chicken. But let me just highlight this real quick. Second Chronicles chapter 14, verse 10. And there came out of against them Zerah or Zarak, the Ethiopian, with an uh uh, Kawashai, right, in the Israeli Kushi, with an host of a thousand, thousand and three hundred chariots, and came unto Marasha, in other words, Marasha, verse 10. Then Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha at Marasha. So after 10 years of peace, Yahweh died, Judah was invaded by Zerah, the, the, the Cushite. With, with Yah's help, Asa achieved a stunning victory over the invaders. This victory occurred in Marish, uh, Marisha. All right. This is the ancient Israelite city of Judah, where Judah ate plenty of chicken family. Right. This is another source, an ancient abandoned city in Israel has revealed part of the story of how the chicken turned into one of the pillars of the modern Western diet. The city, now an archaeological site, is called Marisha. As I just showed you that in the scriptures, this is a this is a territory of Judah. It flourished in the Hellenic period from 40 to 200 BCE, before the Common Era. The, the surprising thing was not that chicken chickens lived there, there's evidence that chickens have kept, I mean, that humans have kept chickens around for thousands of years, starting in Southeast Asia, in China. But those older sites contained just a few scattered chicken bones. 
People were raising those chicken for cockfighting. But notice here, or for special ceremonies. But notice what it says here. The birds apparently were considered much of a food. And Marisha, though some something changed, the site contained more than a thousand chicken bones. Because you know we the people of the book. They were very, very well preserved. Guess what? They was they was making fossils out of those chicken bones. Okay. All right. All right, family. Right, I'm gonna go for a few more minutes, man, because this is getting it's really late. It's not getting late. It is late. All right. So I just wanted to just kind of show this little source here. So did Judah break the law of eating chicken? <laughs> Guess what, family? No. All right. So let's identify another Shabbat here real quick. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eatings. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came to, and told Moses. And, and he said unto them, this is that which Yahweh has said, tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Shabbat. And to Yahweh, bake that which ye will bake today and see if that ye will see it, see it in that which remaineth overlay for you to be kept until the morning. All right. So this is just given another illustration, right? Verse six, verse 23. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Shabbat unto Yahweh. So now here they are. They're gathering before the Shabbat. Right. They're given instruction to gather all what they, they need to gather. So when the Shabbat kicks in, they need to rest. All right. When we go to verse 26. Right. Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Shabbat. In it, there shall be none. So we just identified another Shabbat. So we identified the 15th, the 22nd. And guess what, family? We have more than enough time. I mean, more than enough Shabbats here to reconstruct our calendar. So here it is, the instructions. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Shabbat unto Yahweh. Excuse the typo. All right. And this is the Shabbat. Confirming verse 26. But on the seventh day, which is the Shabbat. All right. So now let's go ahead and construct this calendar, right? Israelites, right? They arrived in the wilderness on the 15th day of the second month or the next morning, the first day of the week, which was the 16th, the second month of the second month, Israel began gathering manna for six days. After the sixth day of gathering manna, manna comes the next day, which is the weekly Shabbat. The 15th day of the second month was a weekly Shabbat. And the second day of the weekly Shabbat, uh, of the uh, second, 22nd day of the, excuse me, and the 22nd day was a weekly Shabbat. Now that we have done, identified two seven day Shabbats, we can fully reconstruct the second month. So remember, 22nd, 15th, there's 30 days. So now you could count, right? You could count backwards i'm just putting some notes here so when we fill this in the first right the 15th go back seven days to eighth go back seven days to first go up seven days to 29th so guess what we just literally created the first month if i take these uh i got those uh have these up here so this is tell me right we got the first month created i mean the second month created now we could create the first month, right? So the second month of the calendar year is complete. Let's map out the seventh, uh, the seventh day Shabbats of the, you know, first month of Exodus. We can now pinpoint the first Passover occurring on a Wednesday, right? So here's the second month. Remember, family, this is this is the second month. So we have to back go backwards. 30, 29, 28. 27, 26, 25. These are days from the first month. So again, the first Shabbat, right, was on the first um, of the, the first Shabbat. That was the first because the 15th here. So there was five Shabbats in the second month. Now let's backdate it. So now if we go backwards, now we have pinpointed in the first month, there was four Shabbats, the third the 10th, the 17th, the 24th, and of course, this first carry over to the second month. And notice what we did here. 
the tenth month, they gathered the lamb, right? They could they, they notice we're here, they secured the lamb, right? The Passover was on the 14th in the day of preparation, right? So the first Passover fell on the fourth day of the week, right? Uh, as we see here, the first Passover again fell on the fourth day of the week. The first Passover fell on the 14th day of the month. What day was the Messiah crucified? We're going to stop right here. We'll do, we'll say that for part two, but I'm going to go back here. Right. This is the first month right here. This is the second month that we use scripture to reconstruct. And we just proved that the fir very first calendar with scripture, the very first calendar, the Passover occurred on the fourth day, the 14th day of the, the fourth day of the week, which is the 14th day of the month. And guess what? If you count one, two, three. That puts the resurrection on the Shabbat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know I gave you guys a lot of information. And we're going to stop right here. I thank you, family, for the love and support. I'm going to stop right here. I'm about, I am about to, I am going to take it down. Uh, like Karis, Karis one would say back in the day, to the very last compound, right? I'm about, I am about to take it down, but I just wanted to do this special lesson uh, because I know many of you guys are off tomorrow because of uh, some uh, places, uh, you know, they, they are shut down. All right. So that's why I'm up late tonight doing this lesson. All right. So I hope and pray this helps you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. If you if you guys are interested in our Passover, shoot me an email uh, and uh, I'll I'll I'm going to start posting information on that. And so, again, family, I appreciate the love and support. Thank thank you, everyone, uh, for the shoot us uh, uh, super ch um, chats, the super stickers. Really appreciate it. I'll just read it off real quick again to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Thank you for Yah's daughter for the love and support. Uh, let's see here. Thank you, Fanny, for the love and support. Majestic Minister for the love and support. Damon Matthews for the love and support. Sabrina Richardson for the love and support. Uh, Cheryl Steele, Steele for the love and support. Douglas Worley for the love and support. Thank you, family. Really appreciate you guys again for the love and and support. We'll do this, get, do this again. We're definitely going to do this uh, Shabbat. Um, I may do something tomorrow night if I don't upload a video. But with that being said, right, in the words of the Most High, the words that he gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 to 14, he shared these words for Moses to give to the people to encourage them. He said, fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of Yahweh. These Egyptians that you see here today, you will, you will not have to deal with them again. You will not see them again. They will not have power over you again. The Most High will fight for you. But here's the kicker, family. We have to hold our peace. Can't go back. Can't stay here. Keep moving forward. Shalom. Listen. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. Explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this back, Genesis 14, verse 13, Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham, born in the city of a black man, called Nimrod, grandson of Ham. Ham had four sons. One was named Cain. Here, let me do some explaining. Abraham, Isaac was the Jacob had 12 sons, for real. And these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10, these were the children of Israel. According